All right. Welcome, welcome everyone to uh, Cincy JS. Uh, I'm Kevin. This is Gaslight. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming by. Um, this is also my dog Bona over here. If she comes around, you don't have to pet her, although she will ask very nicely. Um, um, so today we're going to talk about Elm, and uh, Ron's here going to give us give us a talk. Um, so yeah, glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy the pizza in the back, and um, yeah, we'll talk to you later. So. Without further ado, Ron. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. So on Cincy Tech Slack Monday afternoon, I needed somebody to talk about Elm. I volunteered. So if my slides or anything are a little light, it's because I didn't have too much time. Not that I'm a procrastinator. That's my normal excuse. This one, it's time. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. So we're going to talk about Elm. And why are we talking about Elm at a JavaScript user group? Well, Elm helps us to write JavaScript. It compiles down to JavaScript. And if that sounds crazy, just bear with me for a little bit, and we'll see. We'll see whether we think that's a good or bad thing. All right. I'm not that great at PowerPoint, so I'm just going to click through these manually. So these are my adventures. I've been using Elm since about Thanksgiving. I can say last year, it makes it sound a lot longer. Since last year, so. Uh, and, and I found the experience to be really great and not really hit any large walls that keep me from continually learning and progressing. And the reason I looked into it is because I really like React and if you're in the React community, you can't help but run across like references to Elm. And I even see that with like the Angular 2 community. I'm seeing references to Elm. So like Victor Savkin is a core like Angular 2 developer. And a lot of his blogs I'm reading through and I'm like, these are great ideas that Elm already does out of the box. So fantastic. So I decided to dig in and see if or what the buzz was about Elm. So the state of the front end, as we know, a lot of us are front end developers. It seems like we don't have enough choice and we have too much choice. So we don't have a lot of choice in the language we get to use to develop for the browser, right? But we have almost too much choice. I see some weird looks, but feel free to chime in if you have different observations. We almost have too much choice in the like frameworks we can use, right? New ones are coming out each day, and you know, I've, uh, towards the end of last year, I saw JavaScript fatigue kind of pop up in the stream, and everybody's just like, ah, there's just too much. Um, our language that we have in the browser is JavaScript, and it has some sharp edges, like some gotchas. People coming from other languages uh, get caught in some scenarios that may not seem strange to, strange to us, but like hoisting and the context of this might take a little bit to get used to. All right. And even our trusted frameworks change, right? Angular to Angular 2 is a giant change. Ember, it seems like, is a big change, but I think their transition path is, is pretty clear. So if anybody's an Ember developer, you know, feel free to chime in and let us know. So this is like the framework wars. This is what our children will know this time period as. Dun, dun, dun. So the more I learned about Elm, the more I really liked that I could kind of sit out the framework wars. It had a lot of what I really loved about React and that environment. And writing to JavaScript, targeting JavaScript, is not really as crazy an idea as it once was, because we're seeing Dart. I think Dart's been around for a little while, but Dart does this. Um, closure with Ohm, and I think there's Reagent as well. Pure Script, and I probably forgot something else, but. Yeah, so yeah, I, when I write JavaScript, it's in ES6 or ES7 and we compile down to an older version of JavaScript. Okay, 
So Elm, the thing that really got me about Elm are these bold claims when you, when you first come to it. It's like no runtime exceptions, which is kind of laughable. It's like, ha ha ha, JavaScript, right. Uh, blazing fast rendering. Uh, so there's a speed chart, which I'll show later. So it's actually rendering faster than some of the frameworks that we go to for rendering speeds, like React. Uh, libraries with guarantee, that's because the static type checking, and we'll dig into that a little bit later. Clean syntax, um, and the JavaScript interop, right? The thing I really liked about React is you could slowly rewrite your large JavaScript app with React. You could rewrite small components and just stick those in. And that was really nice because the um, first place I started using React was we were we wanted dynamic functionality in the CMS that wasn't really giving it to us. So we could just have the CMS render the servlet or pagelet. As long as we had you know, an element in there, we could target that and our app could come alive. And you get the same thing with Elm. Blah, 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 right. I could wax ecstatic all day about Elm, but you probably want to see what it looks like. So, let me just get set up really quick. Whoops. Okay. So when you install Elm, the first way to get it, we all probably have Node on our system, so we can do npm install Elm and do that globally. And that'll pull down everything you need to run Elm. Or you can go out to the site, pull down the binaries, and run that. I already have it. I lost my mouse. So we'll skip this step, and we'll just run Elm and see, see what it has for us. So this will tell us what version of Elm we're running, uh, some of the commands we have access to, and, and how to get help. So Elm comes already with like the development server, so you can get up and running really fast. And it comes with the make to build your project and the JavaScript or even HTML. Sure. Better? Okay, cool. So let's just start by running Elm Reactor. This is the dev server. It's gonna spin up and here we are. Let's go to Hello Elm. We'll start here. If I refresh this, this is the Elm Reactor. It'll show me all my Elm files I have in a directory. And we'll just click on Hello Elm. And we see the Hello World. So what's happening right here? Elm has a module system. So we can pull things in. Right here, we're pulling in the HTML package. And we're exposing the text function. Every Elm app has an entry point. That's your main function. And here in our main, we're just calling text, hello world, and it's printing that to the screen. So if we wanted to just create something else really quick, let's create a view. Oh, that's nice. Let's create a view. And we can start writing some markup. So let's move this hello world into an H1. I hope that doesn't keep doing that. And to write markup in Elm, it's kind of like React. We have uh, our elements are represented as functions. So this is a function call inside of Elm for the H1. And it takes two parameters. One is a list of attributes, and the second is a list of children. Okay, so we create lists by the square brackets. So let's just add our text here, and we'll call our view. Whoops, let's just type it. I might have to restart this. 
All right, so text hello. We'll go over, we'll refresh. Ah, so this is one thing I really liked about Elm. The error messages are really, really descriptive and help you out. So it's actually telling me, you might want one of these to import from your HTML library. So I could go in here and I can add H1, but we might end up writing a lot of markup. So we'll just say include everything. I'll restart this after this example and see if we're still getting those. So I come over here and refresh, and now we see hello. So the, the function I define, view, is kind of, if you've worked in React, these are kind of like stateless functions, right? So Elm tries to keep all functions pure. So the last line is going to return. We, we don't have any side effects inside of our functions. And yeah, really close to React's uh, stateless functions. And if you're asking, well, where do your side effects go, I'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, good. So let's actually restart Adam, because it was acting a little weird. OK. Now let's continue on. Like, Since we're going to have a lot of functions in Elm, we can compose those functions together. So we get some things for free. So let's import. It's not helping at all, is it? Yikes, yeah, sorry about that. Let's import string. Let's go down here and add our hello world again. I can switch to another editor if this is going to keep freaking out on us. All right, and we want to start using some things from the string package, OK? So we can come down here and do a to upper. But there's going to be a problem. Parameters are separated by space in Elm. So it's from the ML languages. And they use spaces to separate those. So we could easily change the order of operations by parentheses. And if we run this now, we should see web page not available. Perfect. All right. We need to upper now. Let's just grab everything from here. OK, so now we're seeing that as two upper. So let's add one more thing. Let's add, we know we're going to need some parens. So let's do repeat three. I wish I could disable those. If anybody knows how to on Adam, let me know. Yeah, this is the first time I've seen it. I was using this to create, maybe if I jump on the Wi-Fi with that. I don't know if it's going out and trying to get things. Uh, yeah, OK. So we're learning a little about Adam as well. So go to the package. This is all my Elm autocomplete, too. So this will be a bit of a bummer. So oh, top right? Ah, OK. All right. So we're using repeat now. And we're going to repeat three times. And we see that repeating. But what's happening here is we're able to compose functions. That's super nice. But we're compromising a little bit on readability. Now, folks that like closure may state to the otherwise. But I feel the readability has gone down just a little bit because we're starting on the inside. And we have to read out to figure out what's going on. So Elm gives us another way to compose functions. We'll go ahead and 
comment this out. And now that my own package is gone, uh, it's trying to comment a different way. So a comment it are um, the two dashes. And let's start with our string, hello world. And let's go and call our first function. All right, we'll do two upper. And then let's finally call our text. We'll leave repeat out for now. And if we go over here, we see what we would expect. So what's happening here is we're starting with what we want to work on, the hello world, right? Next, we're pushing that, the result of whatever's run there in as a parameter to two upper. So this is, um, it's, it's returning a partially applied function, also known as currying or Schoenfinkeling. I don't know why that one didn't catch on, but currying. And we could easily go in here now and just add our repeat, send in the first parameter. It will provide the second. And there we are. And actually, I'd like some space. So Elm string concatenation is the double plus instead of the math operator is in JavaScript. So we can add that. And now we're seeing some spaces. The pipe is in, um, I didn't understand. The per, so when you pipe to repeat three, mm -hmm. three is the first argument to repeat. So yeah. it's filling in. The last parameter. It will always put it in the last place. Yeah. Okay. So well, there are ways to kind of change that. But for our example, it's going to put it in the last place. Okay. So yeah, there are ways to work around that. But uh, So we could even create our own functions, and we don't have to do anything special to get this um, partially applied function coming back or occurring. So if we come here and we create a function triple, uh, we can now call repeat and three, and we'll have it pass in a message. So we need our function to accept one parameter message, and we separate that by space, okay? And then now we can call triple and we're seeing the same result. So you don't have to do any extra work to get, to get that composability, right? So that's, uh, that's super nice. Okay, so these are kind of basic things to show some of the functionality of Elm. But I think where Elm really shines is in, in the React world, I have a slide for this, I think. In the React world, oh, did I skip it? Oh, bummer. I had my React stack that I use. And it's a, a pretty basic stack I just use. Webpack for the build, Babel for the transpiler, React. I use Flux, but I, I use the Flux pattern, but I use Redux. I use Immutable JS to kind of keep me in check for my testing. I use Mocha. I also use React Router. I also use, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff. And, and putting this together can get a bit hairy. And these are some of the complaints that you see if you're on the Twitters and you follow anybody in the React community, you see people complaining like, man, it's so hard to get up and running. There's no like React CLI or, or no clear path, right? So Elm gives us a little bit of instruction on how we should structure our components and our application, and it's called the Elm architecture. And if we look into, let's start with our counter. <clears throat> this is kind of stubbed out and we'll fill it in. We have our imports at the top. We have our main function and we're using something Elm provides. It's called the start app. So Elm has this idea of signals and it, it has a little bit of a learning curve. So they provide 
start app to say, don't, don't worry about that yet. You can dig into that later. We're going to wire everything together for you. And we'll see the advantages of starting that way. So this is just calling into start app. It takes one record, which is like an object in JavaScript. And we're just setting it equal to like our initial model, where our view, and where our update is. So we see that our application and all of our components are divided into here, into this uh, way. So we have our model, our update, and our view. Is anybody familiar with Redux? Have you seen Redux? OK. So both of you guys are going to have an easy time with this. Everybody else will we'll walk through it slowly, because it is a nice pattern. All right. So I have, I'm walking off stage for a minute. I always fat finger things, so I print out my code examples so I can remember everything. OK, cool. So let's start at the top. We need to define a model for our application. This is the shape of the data that our app will need. And this is going to be pretty basic because this is just going to be a counter, OK? So I'll take this out. It could be a complex shape, like an object in JavaScript. But here, we're just going to have an int, all right? And then now, we need to set up our initial model, because I said we would have one up here. So we'll just set up our initial model. And we'll set it equal to 0. Our counter will start at 0. I finished the model section. Now I'm going to move. Uh, this is the way I like to work. Some people like to mock out the view first, but I like to start from the top down. Next, I'll go into the app actions of my application. So for you guys that are not familiar with um, Redux, instead of having when you click a button, instead of it calling a function directly and then you do some work, what we want to do is loosely couple what's happening, the work, from where we're actually providing the action. So it's kind of like a pub sub system where when you click your button, it just says, hey, add. However you do it, I, I don't care. Just go and do it. I'm just telling you somebody wants to add. And this separation ends up being really nice because you can go to one place and see all the actions in your application, right? Or for a set of components as we break these down smaller. So for our application, it's going to be fairly simple. We're just going to have one or two, actually, sorry. And I'm going to format this a little bit different. Elm has a style guide which really makes it nice. It gives you good guidelines. So when you look at somebody else's Elm project, you, you know how it should look. All right, so we have um, increment. And since it's a counter, we need to have decrement. So these are the actions in my application, everything that my app can do. This by itself does nothing. It's just like an enum in, in other languages. So we need to wire it up to the updater. And that's actually happening here in the start app. So in the update function, it takes in an action and our model. And it's just a simple case statement, right? So it's going to say, it's going to pass in the action that somebody fired. In this case, it's increment. And it'll catch on that, and then it'll do what we need it to do, right? Hold tight. We'll get there. If anybody's feeling lost, we will um, get there in a moment. OK, so we're catching on increment, OK? And then we're just going to update our model, and we're going to add one to that. Let's do our decrement. And our model will we'll take one away. OK? So what's happening? Just to 
little bit of a recap because this is new. It, it seems a little confusing. We're taking the, we're, we're going to call an action in our markup. This will make more sense when we have everything. We're going to call one of these flags. These flags know how to route into update, and then it will do the work that we need to do. It's hard to tell by this syntax, and we'll see some, um, a different syntax a little later. But what's actually happening here is we don't have a type model, and then we're incrementing model by one. We're actually going through here and returning an entirely new model because everything in Elm is immutable. And there's an advantage to that. After you get used to working in that type of environment. And I'll show you one of the advantages here in a second. Okay, so model's looking good. Let's start writing our view. Oh, I left the annotation in there. We won't worry about that yet. I'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so do I have, all right, good. All right, so now we're gonna start writing some markup. Let's write a div. Actually, let's give ourselves some space. And it's going to have some children. So the divs are our parent. And if the formatting looks a little weird at first, um, this is based off Elm style guide. And I was amazed how quickly I got used to seeing markup in this way, and it was really, really readable. Okay, so we have our div. We're gonna have a button. Okay, and we'll just leave that blank for now, and we'll make the text a plus for, this will be our add button. We'll create, this is where uh, we're gonna have another div, and we will, yeah, let's just print out the model text. kind of simplifying my example on the fly, which means I'm gonna run into trouble. But that means we get to test Elm's compiler and see if it can really put us back on the, the straight and narrow. So another button with the text of minus. Okay, so we save that, go over here. We're gonna to have to get into the right Project, counter. Ah, can't find variable model, right? So that means we've missed something over here. So we can add the model. And we're getting some other issues because we've left a little bit of the wiring that we, we get with the start app. So I'm going to add a, a few more things in here. We have our we get an address parameter, and this is how it routes to those actions when, when we're going to call those, okay? So, action, yeah. Okay, and you see we're just getting heaps of errors, but if we really dug into these, these are, um, these are super nice and helpful errors because what's happening is I've explained how I want this to look. This is the signature or the type annotation for uh, this function, and right now I'm violating it. Whoops. So I'm just gonna get rid of that. And I'm gonna add a little bit more work in here. It's gonna yell at me because I'm not actually using the address, right? It doesn't want you to have unused parameters in your app. So here's how we're gonna tell the button to click fire off its message. That message is gonna go out to our update. It's gonna create a new model. In turn, that's gonna get passed into our view. We do that by an on-click event. First parameter is the address. It'll handle the routing for us. And then we're just gonna call increment. And we'll do the same down here. Decrement. Let's see if we get less errors. Okay. 
perfect. So it's just, this is a negative one, by the way. And it was letting me know that, so. There we go. So now we see something on the screen. But does it work? Ah, it does. Okay, let's go over one more time how this application's flowing. But now instead of starting at the top, I'm gonna start at the bottom with the view. And if anybody's just super lost, raise your hand. Let's, uh, let's try to figure this out together. I've created some markup, okay? I have a div, and if we remember, elements take two parameters, a list of attributes and a list of children. So the second list right here is gonna have all the children for that div. I have a button. The button needs an on-click event, but I'm not actually wiring directly to a function, like increment or decrement, which you, you might see in examples in other frameworks. I'm just clicking on that button, and I want it to address the application like, hey, increment. However you do that, I don't care. I've done my job, and it's done. And the same down here with decrement. Now here, we're reading from the model, and we're just converting that to a string and printing out the text. That's how we're getting the number. Okay, so the important thing about this is we've now decoupled the actions and the work from our application from our view. We're gonna send out messages to do the work on our view so we have one place where we can see how the state of the application is being changed. And that's gonna come back and flow down in the application. If you've ever seen the flux chart or the redux chart, our data is now flowing in a consistent way to where when you come into my application, you already know where things are changing, right? You don't have to dig into, uh, the best description I've ever heard is an iceberg. You look at one of my functions and you see the tip of the iceberg and you're like, ah, I get it. I see what's gonna happen. But you didn't know a couple lines in there, I launched missiles. And now you've just launched some missiles and hurt some poor people and, and, and it's bad news. You didn't see the bottom and the complexity where it really is at the bottom of the iceberg. We sunk the ship. So separating that out gives us a clear way to see how data is flowing through our application. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So if you're if you're familiar with React, you know that the React um, render function gets called multiple times, right? So it'll re-render anytime the data changes. Elm is doing something very similar. It, it uses the virtual DOM or a virtual DOM and it's, it's batching those requests, and it's making really smart decisions about when that should re-render. So when it receives a new model, it's just re-rendering the view. I know there's more questions out there. Right, so that's where we've kind of got up and running. See, a lot of times people get stuck with Redux on all the boilerplate you have to do, all the wiring to get things together. We've started with Elm Start App, which is kind of hiding that away from us. So it knows, it's creating the signals and the mailboxes behind the scene. And signals are kind of like, if you've done any RxJS or anything, they're kind of like observables where you subscribe but they have some different semantic meanings. So what we're doing is we're just saying, anytime the model updates, where I'm watching for it here, do what you need to do and update my view. And we see that that's, I mean, this is a counter example. So you're in, in bigger applications, you'll see that the view is still fluid, right? You're not seeing any hiccups. I know when people think re-render, they're, they're thinking of like flashy and really hard stops and, and that. But this is pretty clean. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. 
It is. So is it doing any smart re-rendering, right? Because if we just re-render everything indiscriminately, that, that could really take a performance hit. So they are batching. And uh, that brings up a good point. Let's see. I had another example, but I'm running short on time. This was like an input, like a to-do list. And the thing about the to-do list is we're adding a little bit more complexity. We now have an input box and, and we're adding it to a list and you can turn off things. But the application structure is identical. Like you'll still feel comfortable with the application. But instead of just when I type in this text box, uh, hitting the button and reading from the text box, we're just gonna make the text box reactive. And at any given time, you know what the state of that text box is. Let me do one, one thing really quick. If I go over here to the counter and I hit the little wrench, we're gonna get the time travel debugging. So a lot of things that I like about React is the hot reloading, where you don't have to refresh and lose the state of your page. Uh, if anybody's ever done, you know, in, in certain applications, you make a change, it re-renders the whole page and you lose your state. This will update your state without changing the application. And it gives you time travel debugging for free, which is something that is, is a little tough to set up in Redux. I mean, after you've done it a few times, it's easy, right? So what's gonna happen is to prove that we are, we do have an immutable state, let's go through and click. We see another counter over there to the right, okay? So now if I go back in time, I can see the state of my app at any given time, right? So think about a larger app that you're actually putting in input, all right? You could actually go through, and now that I'm at this state, this is not a very strong example for that, but now I can say, all right, discard the additional state, and now I wanna do this. And it keeps building up your state. And if you have, the hot swapping, you can make changes to your program and still run through the existing use case. Rewind it, change, and run through it, right? Sounds crazy. But, and this summer, one of the things they're trying to add to this is um, export, serialize your state. So if you're running through an app and you're like, I've got a bug, can't figure it out, serialize your state, give it to me or somebody more competent, uh, and they'll put it in their app and they'll run through the, your actions and the state of your change and you can change it. Really nice. All right, so we get immutability. We get type safety. I know I completely like uh, passed on this. This is a type annotation in Elm, and what it does is it tells us everything we need to know about this function, right? So it takes in um, an action, it also takes in a model, and every function in Elm has to return something. So the very last one is your return, right? And there's some nice articles on how to read this. Yeah? Uh, is type optional? Yeah, they're totally optional if you want to add them in your code. The compiler is still going to infer those, so you're not going to escape any errors. It has a very strict pessimistic compiler. And at first, I was like, man, this is gonna be hard. I, I don't know if I like this. I really like running my app and having it blow up in the browser and then debugging it. So once you get used to like that feedback loop, if we have an error in here, let's say we're gonna return an int, okay? And we refresh this you see that your app is replaced by the error message, right? It's not just gonna break and you're never gonna get it back. And if I change this back, my app just keeps moving. I mean, it keeps going. You're not down for that long. And if you're really like, I don't understand the types yet, but I wanna add them, um, you can build this with make and use dash dash warn and it'll say, all right, this function has this type, this function has this type, go ahead, copy and paste them in and, until you get comfortable with it. So it's doing a lot of work for you. One of my favorite errors is um, 
Let's just add that. Ah, did you misspell the module name? Why, yes I did. It's even helping you with the spellings. I don't know how many times I've chased down an error in JavaScript and it's because I fat fingered something. So this was, it seems like it was made for me, which is the person that's a horrible typer. All right, so there we go. Yeah, it gives, when I come down, I can look at that and I can tell what your function's gonna do. So when I'm debugging, I can immediately see, is this touching what I'm worried about? Nope, move on. Is this touching what I'm worried about? Another advantage is if I wanna use your library and another part of my project, it really helps with the autocomplete and IntelliSense. It'll give me that string and make sure I'm using it correctly. So Elm spent a lot of time with its error messages uh, to make those helpful, and that's part of it. So that second part, like, is the first part where you do that the comments, and the second part is really where you see the advantages? Yeah, and I've actually started doing this in my JavaScript code as well. Um, so I'll add a comment above. I know there's, um, there's some things like R type that are trying to, like, make this check against the types, but a type system in JavaScript, I don't, I don't know if it fits. I have a slide for that. And I've, I've read that Elm's package manager actually enforces some extra version. So if you change the, the types of the function. It won't build until you increment the version number. It's like, no, you're not going to underscore me today. You're not going to do it. Yeah, you're not going to do a minor release and break my whole app. All right. so. Angular 2 is taking an approach of TypeScript, right? Because type safety is, uh, as you build large applications, because we're dealing with this right now, it, it really helps. I mean, it is a contract that your function or your, your uh, objects have to live by. I mean, it's really nice. But it seems like TypeScript may be an afterthought. It's like, all right, we need an AC on this, boom. Just put it in the window. So having the type system uh, built in from the ground up really helps. It helps with your messages and, and having a strict compiler. Um, and Elm, the people that actually dive into Elm that uh, really like it, this is Andre Stoltz, and he's best known for creating CycleJS. Have you guys ever heard of CycleJS? Yeah, it's the new framework. You guys should read about that. All right. So, um, and he's even giving, he has dug into Elm and brought a lot into Cycle. Angular 2 contributors are bringing some of that. So even if you don't get paid a dollar to write any Elm code, it's well worth your investment to see these really good practices culminating in, in a cohesive way. Um, React totally is looking at Elm. And Redux, what I mentioned before, when you go to the Redux page, it's like inspired by Elm. It's that whole Elm architecture with the, um, with the actions and then the updater. Uh, it's Elm architecture brought over to the JavaScript world. And it's, yeah. It's really nice, which, I mean, Elm didn't create it, right? It's, it's a pretty common endomorphic monoid, so I'm just joking. You mean Evan Chaplicki, the language author? Yeah, his, his thesis was on, Elm is pretty much his thesis, or more particular, the signals, how signals work. And when you actually write a few apps and you dig into signals, it is really nice, especially if you've dealt with RxJS, which I, I like as well, but then signals are, are just really nice, terse syntax. And, and um, so what happens is now that you have this, this contract that you're living by in your functions, you're gonna get instant feedback when you start refactoring. 
right? It's no excuse not to have unit tests, but it's going to give you some good feedback. So you're not, you know, um, you don't have that problem where you're like, yeah, we totally fixed it and we broke all this stuff over here. So uh, that, that feedback's really nice. Okay. And one thing that I can't give Elm enough credit for, it's simplicity. Like it's really nice, the syntax is clean, it's really readable. Where it does get a little um, less appealing, they give you another way, like we saw composing functions and that. And I feel that Evan uh, Japlicki, the language author, has really taken a lot of his experience learning Haskell and other functional languages and really saved us from that so we can wade in and learn that slowly. Like we don't even have to worry about signals, which is a core thing of Elm. He's even said, worry about that later. Just get in here and start writing your app. And I think that's really, really nice. And a lot of things that are scary in functional languages, uh, you, he either, kind of uses a softer name until you can dig into it much later. But there's a lot of consideration. So his goal is to take JavaScript developers and give them a functional way to write their interfaces, not bring functional people that may not want to write user interfaces for the web um, and bring them into the web. That's not the goal. All right, yeah. Yeah, so I didn't pay him anything to stage these questions. Those are totally free. So one thing I like about React is you can say React render, you can target an element, and your app can live inside that space. That is really nice for slowly rewriting or just testing. You're like, hey, I just want to change this search box, or I just want to try it out inside my Angular directive. Like you can wrap it in a directive or, or use it in Angular or inside your React application. Some of the most famous rewrites, um, like no red ink, have happened in the React world. But you could totally do this in the Angular world as well. So we could say, all right, I just want to get the element by ID. I want to stamp that out into that div. I'm going to go through this uh, real quickly. You could do full screen. That means take over everything. You're now an LMAP. Um, but how do we get data in and out of Elm? Well, there is an interop between JavaScript, because you can't rewrite your whole JavaScript app from the ground up. Uh, so Elm has ports. So inside, we could have a signal waiting as like, all right, you're going to get some data. And when you get that data, you do your work, and then you pass that back out. And it gives us an API, like, all right, whatever your Elm app is called, ports add user, and then it uses sin to send that data in. And this is just a JavaScript object, so you're still thinking in JavaScript. And then, uh, where's the subscribe? Yeah, then you can subscribe to that and have a function listening, and you'll get the result of that back if you want to do work on that. Is that an actual observable? Uh, no, they do their own kind of observable. It's kind of, yeah. So they make their, their own observable. And I wanted to show the speed. This is a little bit dated, um, but they're, they're working on refreshing this. So Elm is super fast. Like, I know that Ohm is going through some changes now to speed up things. Angular 2 is coming on the scene with some speed improvements, and even React has made some since then. But Elm is, is really fast. In fact, I mean, we're starting to get to the point where speed is not going to be why you pick, pick a framework. They're all going to be really fast. It's going to be, how can this help my team? So right now at work, we're working on a prototype that is um, it's going to show how Elm can scale across teams. So we have an app right now, and we're having large app issues. You know. Bugs get introduced. You have multiple people working on this. You have new people coming on. You have new people rolling off. Sometimes it gets tiring explaining 
you know, the architecture over and over again. So you might shortcut a definition here and then that person may get into trouble. And Elm's compiler really helps in the structure of the application, the architecture. So we, we showed like a single app, right? But that scales to components. If you don't need the updater, your, your app is just going to, somebody's gonna pass in data and you're just gonna be a view. You can just use the view. And you can keep your state, you try to keep your state as high as you can inside of the, the element tree or the component tree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm almost out of time. The last thing I wanted to talk about, so ports, that's how you can, you can go back to work today and have something running in Elm by the end of the day. Just let me know how that works out for you. And um, I just wanted to talk about side effects really quick because side effects was the first thing that I encountered in Elm that, that took a little bit to get used to, right? And, and so in a front end app, you've got to make XHR request. That's counted as a side effect. So it really can't go into the core of Elm that we're writing because we need pure functions. We need everything to be pure. But without getting data from the outside world or observing the outside world, your application's not gonna be that great. I mean, this counter is pretty nice, but it's not gonna be the next big app, right? So what Elm does is it, it realizes there are effects, so it just wants to manage those. So it says, remember this nice loop we have going on? We're gonna put the effects right over here to the outside. And this port model that, that we've created to where data can get in from you know, somebody from the outside, let's use that for our effects. So you have an XHR request. The only way that data can get into your app is via a port. So it's reusing the same model. So that way you can quickly trace the route in which your data entered your application. And we can still keep to our, you know, functional tenants, right? Does that make sense? A little bit, not much. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was, uh, was that a lackluster uh, example? The immutability, since we don't actually change the state, we still have, it, it uses like a graph memory uh, model. It's still efficient. We can roll back to any point within the app, right? Because we still have that existing state. It's all so fast. Yeah, yeah, so when you need to change an object, it gives you what has changed and it will map that to, oh, I can reuse this, so now I'll give this as the structure. Yeah, that's kind of what you asked. Yeah, except for they, they do it by discipline where Elm actually can have, yeah. So yeah, if you use Redux, that is what Redux is trying to do. You have a reducer right, and your old state comes in, what you want to change, you'll put those together and return a new state. But yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So yeah, yeah you're seeing this model replicated in, in a lot of places because it, it makes sense. And it gives you some really good tooling as well. Yeah, I'm about halfway. So uh, I'm using Flux. Mm -hmm. In Redux, in Redux yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if if you guys are open, I could come back and give more of an in-depth talk into the advantages of of some of these things. So a lot, some of this you can do with um, React and Redux right now. Uh, but you're not gonna get it out of the box. Like I just installed it. And then I ran my app and I had it. I didn't have to wire up Redux, learn that, then wire up the Redux debugger, 
But if you have routing, then you need React Redux simple router, not Redux router, because that's too complicated. And, but, you know, see, it's, it's trying to make it easier for you to get up and running. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Ah, so Elm has really tried to bring a lot of things into the fold and give you as much as you need. Uh, so testing uh, is, is a package that you have to pull in. It just doesn't come down with Elm. And the router is another one that, that doesn't come with it yet. Uh, so those are goals that are on the, you know, that, that they want to look at. But routing is not that difficult with that package, but it's not part of the core. You have to actually pull that package in to, to run it. Same with your unit test. OK, some things to do at home. Uh, there is a nice dinosaur here. And uh, can I jump on Gaslight? Are we going to get it? Awesome. Elm architecture. Uh, pull down Elm, clone this repository, and this will walk through a lot of the architecture and give you more examples. And it'll even show like um, doing XHR requests to get data in from the outside. Uh, go through that. There is also Elm Cohen's. And this will give you the actual, there are some things, as you saw, that are different um, in Elm Lang versus JavaScript. So if we go to Elm Lang, I think it's docs. Yeah, there's a Ford JS user. There are some things that are a little bit different than JavaScript. And they do these for a reason. But the Elm Cohen's are really nice to get you familiar with the, um, with the application, and you could just use Elm out of the box when you install it. Comes with the Elm REPL. And you can start running Elm right away. There's so many more cool things I wanted to show you, but I think I'm out of time. So uh, definitely the Elm architecture. Take a look at that. The Elm Cohen's. And yeah, uh, so Elm has a package manager because everybody's got to have a package manager, right? Uh, so we do Elm package install, and then whatever your package is. So, you know, HTML or testing or whatever it might be. And if you just run Elm, uh, you'll, you'll see that the, um, the package, how you can install things and get help on it. But I found out that developing even a larger Elm application <laughs> The amount of packages I use compared to the amount of node packages I use is like stark. Like a pretty big application, we have four. We have another big application that's all JavaScript, and I don't even want to look at the. I just delete it and run it again if I ever have to dig into it. So, uh, yeah, your dependencies are much more lighter because it's it's the it's a lot of really good practices baked into the language. So you don't have to pull something. You don't have to pull in immutable JS. You don't have to pull in Redux. You don't have to pull in, right? Yeah. So it's worth uh, diving into and taking a look at it. And there's some really nice talks on, on YouTube as well. Anything else? Nothing? No? 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 All right, cool. Thanks for having me, everybody. Yeah, thanks.